Jesus said to the Jews that believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Tell me something. Do you feel free this morning? Have you felt free these last two years? Of course not. I mean, you felt like a prisoner. Not only that, but you felt lost. You don't know which end is up. And what was true yesterday is a lie today. And you've been spun around so many times you don't know who to trust. Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. Can you see this happening in the world today? People taken captive by deceit. They used to come to church to hear and to find truth. And they would hear about Jesus and they would believe. But then all of a sudden, one day, they stopped coming. Why? What causes people to get bored with Jesus? They could say, oh, yeah, you know, he died on the cross for my sins, but I'm... I think I'm looking for something more. I'm trying to put the pieces of my life together on this whole Jesus thing. I don't know, maybe there's something else out there for me. I mean, what about evolution, right? It says it's true, and that pushes God completely out of the picture. Or we start to believe the media, the news, which tells us about God's design for sexuality and marriage is outdated and that we should just follow our heart or that we should just, whatever you want to do is fine or do what makes you happy or you do you and you start to believe it and you turn away from spiritual things and you shift your life towards material things. I start to focus my life on money and popularity and pleasure. I'm just trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together, but when I do that, I push Jesus out of the picture. Have you ever done that? We can do that. But it doesn't happen right away, it happens over time, and sooner or later, you realize the world has been lying to you. The philosophy of this world is deceptive. Evolution, sexuality, money, popularity, pleasure, or the, the fact that the world spins around you. Even though the world tells you that you can have it all, you begin to realize that maybe you're still missing something. You're not as happy as you thought you'd be. And who knows? Maybe you're even miserable. But we shouldn't be surprised. It's an age-old story. The first story in the Bible begins with two children of God, and they are born of spirit and breath. Genesis 2 says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land, and was watering the whole face of the ground, then the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Adam and Eve came to life from the pneuma, the living breath of God, which means from the very beginning, before we start adding anything else to your life, you are a spiritual person. God made you from the material and the immaterial. It's in your DNA. It's science. It's truth. It's fact. You see, the first lie that we are ever told is that your life, this planet, it's all just one big accident, one giant explosion, and then millions of years of tiny other accidents, and then accidentally one day you're born. But see, if that's true, then nothing matters. If that's true, then there is no purpose, no plan, no morality, no reason for existence. But when God tells the story, his story says, for you formed my inward parts. 
You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God says that you are spiritual. God says that you are unique. There was a purpose to your existence. You are here for a reason. You are wanted. Your life has meaning. You know, even with science and with all their theories, there are still so many things that science can't even explain about your human body. You've been told all your life that your fingerprints were unique. Nobody else in the world has fingerprints like you, not even your identical twin. Why? Has anyone ever said why? What's the point? I mean, step up, evolution. How did that happen? Ask a scientist, ask a doctor what the purpose of having unique fingerprints means or how that happens. They have no idea. Why do we all have different blood types? What's the deal with that? Explain that, evolution. It can't. Doctors have theories, but they don't have facts. Why do you have a dominant hand? You're so used to having a dominant hand and identifying yourself as either a lefty or a righty, but we take it for granted and we never stop to think about the fact that you have one hand that significantly functions better than the other. And given everything we've learned about evolution and survival of the fittest, why haven't we evolved to have two dominant hands? Scientists have no idea. Doctors don't even know why you have an appendix, right? We're, we're out there sending 90-year-old men into space and we still don't understand the function or the reason behind a, a whole organ in your body. That's because doctors and scientists nor a cosmic explosion made your body. God did. And he made it from the material, earth, and the spiritual, his breath. We can even prove it. It's in the creation story. God made plants and water, sun and moon first, and he made people last. Why? I mean, isn't it a made up story? Well, consider this. Human beings live in a partnership with the earth. We have a naturally symbiotic relationship. How so? Well, humans exhale carbon dioxide, and inhale oxygen. And plants utilize our respiratory waste and produce oxygen so that we can live. The world needs us to live. And we need it to live. Humans were made after plants because we need the oxygen that they make. You've been lied to, ladies and gentlemen. Living out there, out there in the world, it's like living in space without a helmet. It might be a big, beautiful place, but there's no air out there. And the longer you spend out there, you are just breathing in garbage and lies. It's a cover up. It's the great conspiracy, but it's not the conspiracy about the moon landing or JFK. It's not even the conspiracy that you're currently thinking about. No, the lie that's been long dangled before you is this, that this is all there is. Jesus was a human teacher. You are mortal, and one day you will cease to exist, and there is no point to your life other than to make money and to indulge your desires. But the Bible, the only book that contains real truth, the only book that reveals your true identity and purpose and says that, no, God came here to help us, God came here to redeem us, to save us, and that his son died, came back to life, I know, that's Easter. It's, it's the wrong holiday. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not Easter today. And, and, and this book, 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 right, this Bible of truth tells you what happens next. After Jesus died and came back to life, the Bible tells you the truth. The Bible tells you exactly how the conspiracy started. Matthew 28 says, Tell people that his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. 
It's from day one. God told his story, and then the world stepped in with a lie to cover it up. And the longer that you spend out there living, breathing, and sucking up those lies, the longer you are living without real air and you are choking and you are barely getting by. The men and women who wrote this book, they were eyewitnesses to the events of God's handiwork and Jesus' life. They watched as Jesus stood alone on the spiritual battlefield and the temptations of the devil and the evils of this world. They saw him hang on a cross in humility, looking like the one who had been taken captive. They watched as he took his final breath and they were certain that the battle had ended, that Jesus had defeated darkness, that Jesus had defeated sin. And then on Easter Sunday, they became the eyewitnesses to the empty tomb. And then for the next 40 days, they saw Jesus teach. And all the while, the political spin doctors were concocting their own story to hide the truth about what happened on that Easter morning. But the Bible, the church, it was the only place telling you the truth. That's the story the disciples spent the rest of their lives proclaiming. That's the testimony they continue to share with us through the scriptures. And this book is about your victory because of Christ's victory. And it's in that testimony that makes all the difference. This book, your church, your community is here so that we all don't just give up, wander away, live out there in the lies of the world. These words testify to Christ's victory because that means the world's stranglehold can be broken. We no longer have to live as slaves to lies. We've been set free to live lives of service to our good and gracious God. The Word of God, the Bible, contains the truth that entire civilizations and individuals grow by. It became the moral foundation and ethical principles that our nation was built on. But what is truth? What is truth? It was the philosopher Immanuel Kant who said, two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing wonder and awe. The starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. See, that's because truth is not a moral construct. There is a spiritual law that is above human law. It's transcendent. There, there has to be a standard that is higher than my own desire. There has to be a standard that is higher than what I think is best for me. And this moral law, it is written on every human heart. The Bible says it like this. If you sin without knowing what you were doing, God takes that into account. But if you sin knowing full well what you are doing, that's a different story entirely. Merely hearing God's law is a waste of your time if you do not do what he commands. Doing, not hearing, is what makes the difference with God. When outsiders who have never heard of God's law follow it more or less by instinct, they confirm its truth by their obedience. They show that God's law is not something alien, imposed on us from without, but woven into the very fabric of our creation. There is something deep within them that echoes God's yes and no, right and wrong. Their response to God's yes and no will become public knowledge on the day God makes his final decision about every man and woman. The message from God that I proclaim through Jesus Christ takes into account all these differences. So, according to the Bible, there is a law that transcends the law of humans, even though we may not like it. This law, this truth, it is knowable, and it is planted in our hearts. It can be distorted, it can be covered up by the world, but it's still there. But even more than that, we are accountable to it, because it's a knowable truth. It's a doable truth. And to be in touch with that truth is to be in touch with the only reality. The world is built on truth. The world operates best on truth. 
That is why scientists can depend on the laws of nature that they have discovered, because the laws of science don't belong to science. They belong to God. Science is only discovering the laws that God used to create the world. When, when so often you hear people say, well, that's, that's your truth and I have my truth. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as your truth and my truth. There is only God's truth and it's transcendent. We can't, we can't both be right. You might be closer to the truth than me, but we can't both be right. There is an objective standard of truth inside of us and it is above us. There is a moral order to the universe, just like there is a physical and material order. The truth can be known. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Isn't it tragic that the greatest treasure of heaven, the greatest gift that was ever given to earth, Jesus Christ, God's truth, which is ours by faith, is also the greatest threat to the world. And the sad truth is, the world will hate you for holding Jesus in your heart and speaking Jesus with your mouth. So, I figured, since we're uh, heading into Halloween and Thanksgiving and Christmas, which typically is a season of cartoon movies and fairy tale, this seemed like a good time to drop some truth. So from now all the way until New Year's, we're gonna look at the only truth that matters, the God's honest truth. And we'll cover the Bible, we'll talk about where it came from, we'll talk about the truth of history, but since today is Halloween and we are uh, heading into it tonight with our Trunk or Treat celebration, I think first we should address some of the lies that you've heard about Halloween. But first, we should ask where Halloween came from. The real answer is it came from everywhere. It came from all over. But I think the strongest influences came from Ireland. About 2,000 years ago, the Celtic people celebrated a festival called Sawin. Sawin means summer's end. It was believed to be the beginning of fall, and it was the most spiritual time because the Irish people felt that during that time it felt very mystical, and they believed that a gateway or a portal would open up between our world and the world of fantasy, between our world and fairies and leprechauns. But the most important thing about Sahwin was family. Families would actually set a plate for their deceased relatives at the dinner table. And then around the table at dinner, they would tell stories to their children about their grandparents and great-grandparents. And before dinner, they would say a prayer for them. Well, after the Roman Catholic Church brought Christianity to the Irish people in the seventh century, some of their traditional folk customs got Christianized. And in 835, Pope Gregory IV moved all of the Catholic Church's All Saints Day holidays and festivals from the spring to November 1st. And he was trying to replace the Irish holiday, Sahwin. Because to him, the two holidays were similar. All Saints Day is a dinner where you honor the dead and the church rings bells for all the souls that are in purgatory. And so Pope Gregory was hoping to meld those two holidays together into one and thus convert the Irish. Well, on October 31st, the night before All Saints Day, is a Catholic mass called All Hallows Eve or Halloween. And if you think about it, the word Halloween is just a combination of two other words, holy and evening. So first, let's recognize the truth, right? The word Halloween is a Christian word. That's the truth. So how did Halloween get associated then with witches? Ah, well, as you can imagine, the Irish didn't just jump on board with Pope Gregory's new Catholic holiday, and some of them still celebrated Samhain. And they would have their families and their homes, and the uh, Catholic Church would see this, and they would just assume then, well, they didn't get converted. They're still pagan. And Pope Gregory 
made the announcement, that means those people are evil. Now, dressing up in costume and going door to door, that is a Scottish thing. It seems that theater troops would dress up in costume and they would go door to door in local neighborhoods and they would either sing songs or they would enact scenes from plays in the hopes that the people in that neighborhood would then give them food. In other parts of England and Belgium and Germany, Austria and Italy, poor children had a practice of also going door to door on All Hallows Tide, Halloween, to beg for soul cakes. Families would make these little small cakes and they would give them to children. After the children had, and get this, said a prayer and a blessing for those in the home. Are we hearing this? So children had a tradition of going door to door and they would say a prayer for the family that was inside and then the people who lived there would give them a treat. Let's bring that tradition back. Shakespeare even mentions this tradition in his play, Two Gentlemen of Verona. And then in the 19th century, when the Irish and Scottish immigrants brought their Halloween traditions to North America, that night also became uh, associated with pranks and vandalism and mischief. Vandals would go through the night, they would soap windows, they would overturn outhouses, they would pull gates off their hinges, and these pranks, they of course always start off as playful, and the folklore surrounding those pranks was that this was the work of ghosts. But by the late 1920s, the joke wasn't funny anymore because damage to local neighborhoods started to grow. And so, American historians start to see the phrase trick or treat begin to have widespread use in America. And around 1939, we see it in print for the very first time. Hey, that was only 82 years ago. 82 years ago, the American Halloween holiday is not that old. Some Christians say that Halloween honors death or that it glorifies demons. Schools and parent groups will say Halloween is unsafe and so we should respond, we should do something, we should change it, we should make it safer. Well, let's look at those claims, all right? Let's look at those claims really quick and then of course we'll close with some biblical application. First claim, Halloween is an unsafe holiday. Lie. That is a lie. I think this is one of the ones that surprises the most people. Most of us can remember a while back, right, there was a candy scare, and parents were encouraged to inspect every single piece of Halloween candy. Hospitals were volunteering to x-ray your candy, which now in retrospect doesn't seem to be any safer. Uh, fire departments were volunteering to inspect your candy because we all heard that people were putting razor blades in apples or that they were injecting poison into candy bars. You know, if that kind of thing happened today and we all heard that, right? We read, you know, we read that on Facebook, so it's true, or we saw it on Twitter, we would Google it, right? We would Google it. Well, back then we didn't have Google. So we all trusted it. We all believed it. But it was never true. You can Google it now. Go ahead. Try to find a case that validates all the rumors and claims that you've always heard about candy tampering, and you won't find it. David Emery is a freelance writer. He's an avid chronicler of urban legends and popular culture with special interest in folklore. And listen to what he says. David Emery says, no child has ever been injured or killed as a result of ingested, adulterated candy, apples, or other treats collected on Halloween. Not one child, no one, not even one. No children have been harmed. Joel Best is the chairperson of the University of Davis Sociology Department and has contributed a lot of research to this. He says, since 1983, I have followed stories about contaminated Halloween treats 
in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Chicago Tribune, dating back to 1958. And every time a case has been reported, the cause of death or injury has turned out to be something other than Halloween candy. So that first claim was a lie. Second claim, let's not use the word Halloween because it's probably more Christian if we say harvest festival. That's a lie. It's a lie. Year after year, I see banners from local churches that run away from the word Halloween. And they feel that it's the safe alternative to say harvest festival, because those two words sound happy and innocent, but they couldn't be more wrong. Harvest festivals originated with the pagans. They made sacrificial offerings to the gods at an appointed time in autumn to show their gratitude for a successful harvest. And the feast usually consisted of a large meal and music and decorations and dancing. Remember, Halloween means holy evening. It was the evening mass before All Saints Day, and it originated with children who went door to door who said prayers for families. So when concerned adults try to soften Halloween, they literally, literally replace a Christian word with a pagan word, and then they try to sell it back to us as family-friendly and safe. But it's just another example of how the world gets it wrong. Third claim, Halloween is a satanic holiday. Lie. It may seem strange that Halloween, which is a secular celebration where we see cardboard cutouts of goblins, ghosts, and witches, that it somehow got its name from a holy day devoted to Christian martyrs. But that's how it started. And in the 75 years that Halloween has been celebrated in America, it's been fun, family-friendly, and a community-centered holiday. No little boy this year who puts on a Ted Lasso costume is thinking about Druids or the ancient Celts. In fact, Halloween is as far removed from its beginnings as Christmas is from its. The Apostle Paul actually ran into this dilemma of pagan culture mixing in with Christianity, and he wrote about it in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, and we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. I think if we look closely at what Paul is saying about how the Christian Corinthians dealt with paganism, we can find some truths for ourselves. First thing Paul says is, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Why? Because of our first truth. We love God, and we teach our children to love God. See, the major concern with participating in a pagan practice is what? Actually worshiping a pagan god. That would be idolatry. Idolatry is being unfaithful to God. It's cheating on God. And Paul says, run away. Run away from anything that would make you unfaithful to God. Jesus says in Matthew 23 that to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind is the greatest commandment. And truthfully, there are a lot of other things in the lives of our children that threaten to be idols more than a holiday or the tooth fairy or Santa Claus, right? An idol is something we worship more than God. It's the thing that we give more of our time and more of our attention to. Does Halloween really threaten to be an idol more than, let's say, video games or some of the apps our children watch? As parents, we need to teach our children to run away from the real dangers that threaten to be idols in their lives. Another truth is that we are free in God. This great truth is found a little later in verses 25 and 26. Paul says, eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. See, Paul here is telling the Corinthian church that you are free to shop and to buy food from the store, 
even if you think that food might have been used in a pagan practice. Why? Well, because of the first truth. You love God and you're not a pagan. And so grocery shopping for meat or eating dinner at a friend's house, it doesn't rub off on you through association. You're not going to get pagan cooties. Halloween's no different. It might have had some pagan origins, but so what? So did Christmas. And it doesn't now. And as a strong Christian family who loves the Lord, we can understand that. My parents were incredibly strong Christians, and they were very active in their church and their faith. And I went trick-or-treating ever since I was old enough to walk. The holiday only had the meaning that my parents gave it. And they were strong and mature in their faith to know that. I, for one, think meeting your neighbors is important. Teaching my children to not be afraid of the little old lady who lives at the end of the street, I think that's a good thing. Connecting names and faces and smiles with the closed doors that we normally see is a good thing. Community activity is important. And so anything that gets me out of my house and away from electronic screens and meeting people who live around me, I think that's a great thing. And if you take your kids trick-or-treating, go to every house on your street, introduce yourself, introduce your kids, extend a hand to the adult that lives there, compliment their home, tell them where you live, and end with, well, we'll see you around, or invite them to church. You know, one week before I moved out of my house in California, I was watching my neighbor clean out his garage, and I was nosy, so I peeked inside, and you know what I saw in his garage? Mountain bikes, rafting equipment, motorcycles, fishing rods, camping gear, and a canoe. And I thought to myself, how come I don't know this guy? Too late now, I was moving out. More and more, it's become easier for us to all hide in our homes, to work from home. And now we're only known by the people that we allow in. And sure, you might have some good friends at church, but church can just be another place where we hide too. Especially when we think the world outside is wicked. The world outside is out to get us. God lives in community as Father, as Spirit, as Son, and He designed us to live in community. See, that's the great truth. The world lies to you and tells you that you'll be fine by yourself, that you can make it on your own. But that's another lie. You need people. You need to live in community. How do we do that if we continue to stay isolated? How can we ever introduce our neighbors to Christ if we haven't first introduced ourselves to our neighbors? If only there was a holiday that was built into the American calendar where it was already socially acceptable to go through my neighborhood with my family and meet my neighbors. Don't believe the lie the world is telling you. You can come out of hiding. You can come out of hiding. You know, we're all asking ourselves, what happens next when the world goes back to normal? But what I want to say today is, we don't need things to go back to normal. We need a new and better normal. I think we're all looking for something better than normal. I think now, more than ever, we need honesty and reality and truth. One of my favorite things that Jesus ever said was Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world and a city on a hill cannot be hidden. That's the call of the Christian. That's the call of Christ's church. God calls you to be a beacon of light, a beacon of truth. Let's pray together. 
Lord, thank you for your word because your word is true. It cuts like a knife and it heals like medicine. It brings love, it brings conviction, but most importantly, it brings truth. There are so many things that are trying to tell me how to live. There are so many voices that are all telling me that they are true and they are pulling me left and they are pulling me right. And I'm spinning so fast, I don't know which end is up. I am your child and this is your world. Let me only listen to you. Let your truth be the only truth I live by. Let your politics be the only politics I live by. Let your love be the only love I live by. Let the nourishment that I eat be your word. Let the air that I breathe be your spirit. May the path that I walk be the discipleship road. And may my guide be your son for all time until your kingdom come and your will be done. Amen. Thanks for joining us for our time together. I'm looking forward to the rest of this series, walking through a little bit of truth every single week. I hope you join us. Of course, we are here. We are here for you every Sunday. Please consider returning to church. We miss you. We've saved a seat for you. We have friends and smiling faces that want to hug you again and shake your hand and be next to you. We want to hear your stories. Please return to church. We have services here at our church at 9.30 with our choir and we sing hymns. We also have a service at 11 o'clock with a worship team where we sing contemporary songs. We also have a children's hour at that time at 11 and youth group. We also have a youth group that meets in the neighborhood right now every Wednesday at six o'clock. You can send your kids over to the church. They can walk, they can ride their bike or their skateboard. Uh, they, if they come at six, we will feed them dinner and we will send them home to you in an hour and a half. Tell us how we can be the church where you live. I love you guys. See you next week.